Professor Fiedler. Thank you very much. Uh, stories I tell to my family, science I will tell right now. Thank you, Itzik, for reaching your age. In a year I will be your age. Now I have to respect you. Uh, the, uh, another year we will be equal. I have met him probably oh, 50 years ago when he was the president of the Humane Society in Jerusalem and I was a beginning uh, veterinarian who hated his job. I went back to the United States and went uh, specialized in surgical oncology and didn't cure anyone. I complained and complained and complained and the dean of the vet school told me he's sick of me. They sent me to medical school and I took a degree in human pathology. To my knowledge, I'm the only one in the world who is licensed to work on live animal and dead people. <laughs> it's uh, the only uh, photograph I found. Uh, this is the second Otto Hertz lecture in uh, Tel Aviv, which I still thank you for allowing me to do that. Melanoma in the ear is very common in Texas because white people don't belong in the sun. If uh, we belonged in the sun, we will have melanin, but we don't. Patient didn't die from this, he died from metastasis, and I dedicated my whole life to understand the process of cancer metastasis, because unless a cancer is benign and surgeon can cure them, let me say to you, I say it always, formalin is the best drug for cancer. You put something in formalin, it's dead. Unfortunately, metastases occur before diagnosis. That patient died from metastases to the brain. Now, to cut the to get to the point of my lecture, I want to tell you that there is distinct proof to expand the Paget hypothesis that tumor cells that produce metastases manipulate and use the host. The absolute parasites that know how to use host mechanism, and there's no better example as brain tumors and brain metastases. My uh, late mother died of brain metastases from lung cancer, and I was told that there is nothing can be done with her because everybody knows. Whenever medicine says everybody knows, it means they know nothing. Everybody knows that the broad brain barrier prevents drugs from reaching a tumor. The broad brain barrier is an interesting structure that does not exist in cancer because I have looked now at hundreds of tumors surgical specimen, and there wasn't a single one that did not express VPF. Hal Dvorak discovered VPF, and then Ferrara called it VGF, now we call it VGF, but the function of the, that molecule is to cause permeability. We diagnose metastases, we diagnose glioblastoma because of cerebral edema. If you have edema, it means that the vessels are leaky. If they're leaky, why can't a drug get to a tumor? Since it's not the blood-brain barrier, I had to prove it. What we do is we inject sodium fluorescein intravenously to mice. And here is a cross-section of the normal brain. And you can see that the fluorescein is contained within all the capillaries in the brain. This is a low magnification and higher. This is an artificial metastasis of just about 100 micrometer. The blood-brain barrier is intact, but once the metastasis grows to two millimeter in size, please look, the fluorescein is completely all over. It's leaky, and yet only a few micrometer away, it is within blood vessels. In the tumor, the blood-brain barrier it does not exist, it is leaky. So the question is, uh, excuse me, this is an MRI of patient with lung cancer brain metastases, and my colleague tell me, the radio, radiologist, that you diagnose metastases because contrast media leaks around the tumor. Again, they use the word leak. If it leaks, it means that the vessels are leaky. The vessels are leaky, there's no blood barrier. 
I have dedicated the last few years to understand how astrocytes regulate resistance to therapy. Why is that? First, astrocytes in the brain are stromal cells that are quite interesting. They have one end for foot that touches a capillary here. Indeed, that's again tight junction capillaries with parasites. The astrocyte touch them in one end foot, create gap junction channel that leads to a neuron. And oxygen migrate from blood vessels to neuron via this gap channel. Glucose, galactose, etc., they transfer it to neurons. They participate in neuron signal transmission, they maintain homeostasis, they take garbage from the neuron, bring it back to the bloodstream. And this fabulous review, it says that astrocytes protect neurons but it doesn't tell you why and how. It caught my eye, it was very interesting. Here is a cross-section of the brain, capillary. We stained the astrocytes with blue, and again, they touch from the capillaries to neurons. This is a normal brain. When astrocytes are stressed, and the stress can be anything, it's amazing, three minutes of hypoxia, Production of VEGF, IL-8, IL-6, any inflammatory change, the astrocytes go berserk. And they produce a protein called GFAP, for which we have an antibody. And therefore, we can stain them. And I began to observe that in metastases, this is lung cancer, uh, brain metastases, clinical specimen, astrocytes surround the tumor and infiltrate the tumor. And in fact, on a higher magnification, you can see those astrocytes or the spiders touching neurons and touching tumor cells. I went to our uh, neuropathologist, Ken Aldape, and I said, what is that? He says, everybody knows it, but it wasn't published. Now, every neuropathologist knows it, but it is so common that they didn't bother to tell us about it. It's another interesting phenomenon. And I asked the question, what is the role of these astrocytes in brain tumor and brain metastasis? There has got to be a reason that they do that. When I uh, decided to work on metastasis, the chairman of my department in an Ivy League school told me, you're wasting your time. Metastasis is an anarchy. It's a random process. And I said, there's no such thing as randomness in biology. Everything has to be a reason because that's what... Uh, the smart man Kohelet told me when I read the Bible. And he was the smartest man alive, by the way. What do they do? And what we did is we harvested astrocytes from mice and from human and co-cultured them with tumor cells. T for tumor cells, astrocytes are the A. And to my great surprise, when we then challenged the tumor cells, with any chemotherapeutic drug that you, uh, that you know about, the tumor cells showed increased resistance to the um, cytotoxic drugs. Now, we use therapeutic doses of cytotoxic drug. If I use 10 times the Taxol, everything will die, including the plastic. But you cannot give more than a therapeutic dose in tissue culture or to an animal if you want to do in vivo experiments. The protection was specific to astrocytes. We couldn't do it with any other cell that we used, not fibroblasts, not epithelial cells. We did with some with the endothelial cell, which I'll come to, and it depended on gap junction channels. Because when we did it in a Boyden chamber, the astrocyte did not protect. If you separate them by a chamber, there's no protection. They have got to touch their target cells. We cultured astrocytes with tumor cells, and this is a xenograph experiment. Human tumor cells with mouse astrocytes harvested the RNA, hybridized it, because we wanted to know which genes are expressed, the tumor or the microenvironment, the astrocytes. And we found that no matter what tumor cells we cultured astrocytes with, here I'm showing only two, breast cancer and lung cancer, but we did melanoma, colon cancer, ovarian cancer, 
prostate cancer, and so on, there were 200 genes, common genes, that were highly expressed. By highly, I'm talking five to tenfold. And among them were three genes that were fascinating. These are anti-apoptotic genes, or survival genes. So cells that astrocyte touch, be it endothelial cells or neurons, or tumor cell, unfortunately, express these survival genes. Now, you know, genes are like department chairmen. They give orders, but the workers are proteins. And we showed that, uh, in fact, the breast cancer and lung cancer express those survival proteins if you co culture them with astrocytes, but not with fibroblasts. Wanted to publish it, and a good friend says, nobody will believe you. You have to do knockout experiments. So we did an SHSI knockout and found an interesting thing. If you knock out one survival factor, the astrocyte still protected, another protected, another. We had to knock out all three survival gene or protein to overcome the protection by astrocyte. It means that survival is redundant. Cells will be insane to depend on a single survival pathway. Otherwise, we're not gonna be around. You understand survival is the major purpose of life. That's what homeostasis is all about, to survive, survive, survive. But when we knocked out all three, the astrocytes no longer protected. We then took surgical specimen of lung cancer brain metastases, breast cancer breast met uh, brain metastases, and from the pa same patient, breast cancer lung metastases. The metastases in the brain all express the survival protein by immunohistochemistry. Now the world believed us, we published it, and the conclusion was that the role of astrocytes in physiology is to assure survival of neurons and endothelial cells, and unfortunately, they also do it to tumor cells. They don't do anything to tumor cells that they don't do for neurons or endothelial cells. The real question is, what is the signal that astrocyte transfer through the gap channel from astrocytes to tumor cells to upregulate genes? And we know that light is killing me. We know that when you activate astrocytes, either by IL-6, IL-8, VEGF, or hypoxia, they produce endothelin-1. Endothelin-1 is a protein that was designed by endothelial cells to bind to its receptor which is a serine protease, not tyrosine, serine kinase, excuse me. And when these receptors are activated, endothelial cells shrink. When the endothelial cells shrink, the lumen of the vessel contracts and it increases blood pressure. And in Europe, they've been using agonists and antagonists of endothelial receptors to lower blood pressure. It's an important point as I will discuss therapy. We have done a lot of work on breast cancer metastasis to the brain, lung cancer metastasis to the brain, and melanoma, each in different publications. I want to focus today in the 20 minutes that I have only on glioblastoma because we almost finished clinical trial with the tumor. Now, glioblastoma is a primary tumor of the brain that is incredibly aggressive. I'd like to go down and show you that death is associated with cerebral edema. Cerebral edema, keep in mind, leakiness of blood vessels, no blood-brain barrier. That's how you diagnose it. Patient comes, they have a terrible headache, nothing helps. No honey, no mint tea, no aspirin, no Advil, nothing. They do an MRI and say, oh my God, they have a glioblastoma, a brain tumor. Uh, this is not a joke, this is true. And the poor prognosis, median survival time untreated is three months. Usually surgery takes place, but the rim of the tumor remains because you can't take half the brain out. Chemotherapy is given, timozolomide, radiotherapy, antivascular therapy, corticosteroid, you can extend survival from one to two years, but not a single patient will survive. You hear me? Not one. It's a devastating disease. In America, there's 13,000 a year. 
uh, in the whole world is about 50,000. It's not as common as metastases. Metastases to the brain of lung cancer is half a quarter million patients. But uh, we had to work on glioblastoma because uh, that's what the company wanted me to do. You will see why. So here's the glioblastoma. The MRI of glioblastoma is clear again. Here is the tumor with leakiness. And we began to stain glioblastoma for the endothelial receptors and discovered that like anything else, the tumor is heterogeneous. There is no such thing as a homogeneous tumor because tumor cells divide inaccurately because of genetic instability. Heterogeneity is a fact of life. The tumor is expressed, the A receptor, which is red, the B receptor, which is green, and by confocal microscopy, if they express both receptors, they'll be yellow. That's the clinical uh, specimen. By uh, scanning immunomicroscopy, you can see the astrocytes touching tumor cells, and we made the hypothesis. The hypothesis is as follows. Tumor cells are going to produce VGF, IL-6, IL-8. They're going to be hypoxia. Any one of those is going to activate astrocytes, because we see it, it's GFAP positive. The astrocytes will produce endothelin-1. The endothelin-1 is transferred to gap ch ch channels to the receptors, which are extracellular and intracellular. They bind to the receptor. The receptor will become phosphorylated. We published that once the receptor is phosphorylated, AKT and MAP kinase are activated. Once AKT and MEP kinase are activated, 209 genes are upregulated, among which are the survival genes, and that leads to chemo resistance. Now, the idea was if we will have agonist or antagonist of the receptor, if we can bind, uh, bind them to the receptor, deactivate the receptor phosphorylation, therefore AKT and MEP kinase will not be activated we are not going to see the survival gene expression, and the cells will not be chemoresistant. We had to find a dual inhibitor, and the dual inhibitor was made by a company called Actelian. It's a dual active tissue antagonist, a target, excuse me, a oral act active a targeting dual endothelial receptor antagonist by the name of Masitentan. That's the name they gave it. Uh, again, uh, we tested it, it lowers blood pressure, it's not toxic, etc. We decided uh, to work on it for therapy of brain metastasis and glioblastoma. The company thought I was out of my mind and com consequently I have to disclose that we, myself and my colleague MD Anderson have a patent on what I will tell you because I didn't think it would work. Well, it did. So here is the experiment. This is clinical specimen of glioblastoma. It's highly invasive, and we use a cell line by the name of LN229. Stereotactic injection to the brain, it's highly invasive. GFAP, uh, that's the astrocytes are in both. Heterogeneous for expression of the receptor in the clinical specimen and in the experimental uh, tumor. And very interesting, when we stain uh, endothelial cells, CD31 in red, and the endothelial receptor A or B, um, we stain in green, the yellow will mean that the endothelial cells are positive, and indeed, both in the clinical specimen and in our experimental, not only tumor cells express endothelial receptor, but also endothelial cells. Well, originally, endothelial and endothelial cells, it's not a big surprise, but it, for therapy, it will be the big surprise. First experiment we do is we do protection assay in vitro. We culture tumor cells just with Taxol or Massitentin and do um, a PI index here for apoptosis. We find no change. But if you co-culture with, with fibroblasts, nothing happened. With astrocytes, they protect against apoptosis, and if you add uh, masitentin, 
and timozolomide, which is the drug of choice for glioblastoma, you reverse the protection as shown here. Um, we did a huge number of in vitro studies, but you know, again, curing tumor in tissue culture, all you need is distilled water, just add that to the dish and tumors will die. The important is the in vivo. So we began to use luciferase labeled cells. We inject 200,000 cells into the brain by stereotactic injection. Wait two weeks later when the tumor uh, is established, we ear tag the mice. Every mouse you will see out of the 60 or 70 or 80 has an ear tag, so we can't confuse them. And we wait on day 24 until the tumor is well established, and only then we randomize. So every animal that will be randomized is tumor positive and has an ear tag. The therapy in all the experiments I will show you consists of control mice. They just get um, um, control uh, injection of uh, um, control, inje uh, control uh, drug by oral. Timozolomide, which is the preferable drug in the clinic. We have two neuro-oncologists to our collaborator, and we used exactly what they told us, so we can translate it to the human and we give it orally. The drug is very toxic, so you give it one week on, two weeks off, one week on, two weeks off, and so on. Masitentin is daily, oral, and a combination. If animals are sick, we're gonna kill them, and we will autopsy and examine the brain and do histology on all of them. I have never seen results like that before, where you have absolutely not a single mouse in the combination died, where all the others, this is timozolomide alone, which you expect to see improvement over the controls. All of them are alive, and I told my colleague that this, uh, I don't know why he didn't put the real 0.000001, I mean, this is enough. Uh, and that's why randomization was important and ear tag was important, so we'll know who is who. But more important is here the imaging. So on day 24, when we start the treatment, all animals have a brain tumor. Those who are familiar with the EVIS imaging, red is a high intensity and blue is a very low intensity. And in fact, on the, uh, the end of the experiment, all the animals here are dead and they have more than 60,000 uh, units. Here is 60,000. 50,000 in timozolomide, and in the combination group, it's less than 100. They have no tumor whatsoever. I was worried that maybe luciferase changes the nature of the tumor, and that's why it works so well. The second experiment was done in, with animals that were uh, with non-luciferase label, and we got the same results, uh, just the same as you can see here. But uh, another, uh, these were done seven times for publication, seven times. In this particular experiment, uh, I asked a very interesting question, an important one. Okay, all the animals here survived. Are they cured or will the disease recur? Stop the treatment, what will happen? Will the disease return? And if it does, is it resistant to the therapy or can you use the same therapy again? Uh, the company would like mycetentin to be given in a patient for the rest of their life. It's a very expensive drug. You take it daily, you make a lot of money. The question is, is it necessary or not? So we did this experiment here as I'm outlining. And here there are 10 animals on day 21, all have a tumor. That's the start of treatment. Timozolomide alone, the chemotherapy, mycetentin alone, this is the antagonist, and the combination. Every animal in that experiment has a tumor. On day 97, when we stopped the treatment, you can see the day of death here. You can read it as well as I can. All the control mice are dead, timozolomide dead, mycetentin dead. Not a single mouse here has a tumor. We stop the treatment. But, when you leave the animals alone, on day 146, which is almost 50 days later, two animals 
develop recurrent disease. So we start the same treatment again, mancitentan timozolomide. In these animals, it took another 40, 50 days and the tumor disappeared completely. And in this animal, it didn't respond to therapy. So we have two out of 18 recurrent disease. One responded and one didn't, and I have no idea what to do with this kind of data. Another animal developed a tumor on day 195. A hundred days later, no treatment for 100 days. Place the animal again on treatment, and it has a stable disease. On day 302, I said, that's enough, kill the animal, we need to publish. And this tumor turns out to be timozolomide resistant. Okay? But still, it's called stable disease. The animals are not dead, they're eating. You can see there is no skinny animal that's fine, doing fine. But there is disease that didn't regress. So that's three out of 18. The fascinating thing is the immunohistochemistry. So the receptor, again, uh, green and yellow, receptor phosphorylated will be yellow. Control, the receptor is phosphorylated A, and B is phosphorylated. Timozolomide, the receptor is phosphorylated. Masitentan, which is the antagonist, the receptors are not phosphorylated. You're missing a good lecture, goodbye. And timozolomide, masitentan, they're not phosphorylated, but remember, these animals are dead and these are alive. So that doesn't explain the results. MAP kinase and AKT, yes, 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 no, 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 no. But these animals are going to die and these will survive. We cannot explain it on the phosphorylation of MAP kinase and phosphorylation of AKT. So we go further. We're looking at the survival protein. They are expressed in the control and timozolomide. They are not expressed in macitentin, not expressed in macitentin timozolomide. But these are going to die and these survive. The answer ended up being when we looked at apoptosis, exactly as thought about, that these are anti-apoptotic genes. If you look at tunnel stain, there's very little here, some with timozolomide that we expect, nothing here, a huge number of apoptotic cell here, and I asked my colleague to give me a higher magnification, which you see here. So this is a, a, the control. We're looking at CD31 endothelial cells in red and uh, uh, tunnel in green. And what's fascinating, when you look at the great success, the cells that are dead happen to be endothelial cells. They're white. Now, let me say again, neurons, endothelial cells, and tumor cells, we have eliminated the survival factor, and we're using an anticycling drug called timozolomide. Neurons don't divide, so we don't have a problem. Endothelial cells in a normal brain divide every seven to eight months, so we really don't have a problem. But in glioblastoma, two to three percent divide daily. And since we removed the survival factors, they are going to succumb to the timozolomide, and that's what happened. And it takes us 60 days to kill all of them. No oxygen, no life. And my friend Judah Falkman, God bless his soul, is smiling in heaven because he was correct anti-vascular therapy works. It's not angiogenesis, it's anti-vascular. Do I have a minute or two? Let's sit down. <laughs> if I don't... Now, in Hebrew, in Hebrew we say, Al hithalel choger kemefateach. I have cured a lot of mice in my life. The question is, what about people? And I will change it to say, Al hithalel choker kemenateach. We are almost finished with clinical trial. I have two more slides. Almost finished with clinical trial that is done by Dr. Charles Conrad, who is a neuro-oncologist. Clinical trial is patient to have a recurrent glioblastoma that does not respond to anything. We are allowed to do experimental therapy. 
and you start with very low doses of macitentin to make sure it's not toxic and you reach the calculated dose, which right now is 200 milligrams. At the 200 milligrams now, we have 12 patients and four out of the 10 have complete response. This is the gift that Conrad gave me that made me uh, say I can now retire. I've never seen any, to me, that is the zenith of my career. That's a patient who came to us in January with recurrent glioblastoma, and I need to, I can't read the date. Several months after the treatment, the tumor is gone, the patient was declared disease-free. And that patient, a year later, is still disease-free. So what did we show you? That astrocytes, when they become aggravated, either hypoxia, IL-6, IL-8, or VEGF, produce endothelin. Endothelin then will bind to receptor on endothelial cells, on tumor cells, and on neurons. When that happens, AKT MEP kinase is activated. Many genes are upregulated, among which are the genes that we are interested in, the anti-apoptotic genes. If we can inhibit the phosphorylation of the receptor, of uh, the endothelium receptor on all three cells, AKT and MEP kinase will not be activated. We don't see the survival genes in the animal with the tumor that divide are gonna be dead, any cells. So therapy of cancer metastasis can be based. The problem is the tumors are biologically heterogeneous, whether we like it or not, and rapid emergence of resistant variant cell is a fact of life, no matter what treatment we use, including immune therapy. The approach can be to destroy tumor cells, but I'm saying uh, in honor of Stephen Paget, Isaac Witz, and myself, please, don't forget to modulate the organ microenvironment because this is a great approach to treat cancer, and I thank you very much.